Welcome to this Fain online event. I'm Nikita Gill, and it is my delight and pleasure to welcome one of my favorite authors in the world, Elizabeth Acevedo, to this Fain online event to talk about her brand new, amazing book, Family Lore. Elizabeth is a Dominican American national poetry slam champion and New York Times bestselling author. She is the author of the young adult death novels, The Poet X with a Fire on High and Clap When You Land. The Poet X is a New York Times bestseller, National Book Award winner, Carnegie Medal winner, and was shortlisted for the Waterstones Children's Book Prize. She was selected as the Young Poets Poet Laureate of 2022 by the Poetry Foundation. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to stay here with you, Nikita. Yay. Um, I, I, I would be absolutely thrilled if you could do a reading from this very powerful book, which is about a family and a living wake and so much more. Yeah, um, I'd be happy to. Uh, this is my first adult novel. And so uh, fans of my YA work will realize that uh, while similar subject matters, mothers and daughters, um, complicated intergenerational relationships, um, life, death, everything in between <laughs> is, is similar to, to previous works. This does have, um, I guess, a content warning that it is for mature readers. Um, throughout the novel, there are interviews that are scattered throughout. Um, and I just want to contextualize that I'm not going to tell you why, but this mm -hmm. is an excerpt from one of the interviews from one of the younger generations, um, a niece to the matriarch who's throwing herself a living wake. Yadira, interview transcript. What kind of question is that? Fine. Well, I don't know. And no, I'm not being avoidant. I don't know how any of us learned. It wasn't from our mothers. They acted like their tongues were taken out to be sharpened daily, but rarely to slice a sliver off the hides of their husbands. So I would not have learned it from them. We learned it slowly with our own hands, I think, by taking the silicone covered brush, the one we used to untangle knots on Sundays, don't judge me. I rolled the handle, held tightly between my thighs. The thing I found there jumped. It's funny, but I think of you of all people would understand. The body knows us even when we do not know it. And the body says, I am meat. Tender was struck, seizing when fired up, needing rest when removed from the heat. I like to think there was a time before our mothers and theirs and theirs and theirs, some great great who knew her own pleasure, a time before we were wrapped in corsets and courtships and the approximation of proper. I like to think we were nations of women who undulated to music all our own. I learned some of it like this, the boy who was my other heart, to lick the salt I tasted. I wrapped my lips, how I did so in the hopes he would one day taste me. I decided I didn't care. You and I, we learned from Lola upstairs who recounted to us how moonshine finger popped her in the dim dark canopy trees of Riverside. You learned in the bottom drawer of the armoire when you pulled out your papi's dirty magazines. We learned in the shadows when boys who should not did, when girls who loved, we loved, loved us back, right? We learned in the big beds of other people's parents, didn't we? On a rare occasion, we might have learned in the sunlight. We might have learned in the quiet. We learned as we listened to the still, to the loudness of our hearts, but not from our mothers. It is always such a pleasure to see you perform your work and to hear you read your work. I am so looking forward to the audiobook because I know you you you've done the audiobook, but it's multiple different voices in this book, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. We have six different women um, in the family who are being um, 
kind of their reflections are collected throughout as they prepare for the wake. Oh, and that, so the wake is where we begin and the wake is such an important part of the book uh, without giving too much of, away, uh, of the book away. So at the very center of family lore is a living wake for Floor, a character who is a seer of deaths. Um, right. So there's that other layer that comes into this. Is It's not just a, a living wake for anyone. It's a living wake for a seer who right. specifically sees death. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about death as a central theme within the book? Because it's such a powerful theme within the book, especially in terms of celebrating one's life whilst they're still alive as they're doing for floor, right? And the preparations for that. Right. Well, a living wake is a, a kind of um, unique and fantastical prospect, right? Very mm -hmm. few people, if any, um, actually form them. And so it is a little bit of a conceit that is um, manipulated in order to, to give these women space to reflect on exactly what you brought up, right? Death. And to reflect on death is really to reflect on life, to reflect why leaving um, this plane is just so difficult. I wanted to think a lot about rebirth, right? And uh, Flor is a fascinating character because she can see people and when their deaths will occur. She's someone whose relationship to death is, um, I guess, a little more even keel than most of us. She, it, it's just, it's just natural, right? And so when faced with the prospect of her own wake, it it kind of forced us to compare her relationship to death and all the people around her as well, but also what is their relationship to the, the concept of we die many times in a lifetime. We become and transform many times. We are afraid of dying many times and kind of have to face the, this might be the moment, this might be it, this is the the call from the doctor that might be the scare and, and we don't know this might be the I go into labor and and maternal health is what it is and I just don't know right like we have those questions over and over of is this is this is this it and so each of them you kind of find the pivotal moments in their lives where they're either asking is this it in some capacity right maybe not um, actual corporal death, but the death of a dream, the death of, of a loved one, the death of a relationship, the de right? Like you're constantly facing what it means to mourn um, either the life that you had or the life you wish you had. And so mm -hmm. you're, these women is in, when you're in their reflections, there's a lot, the movement of the book is a lot of back and forth, past, present, past, present, um, over and over. Uh, it is them kind of revisiting the moments where they they had to let go yes of they they had held really tightly and so it's them almost practicing letting go in preparation for the wake and so I think that death as this idea of of, of letting go um but also death as a thing we can prepare for that we you know unless it's a, a tragic accident or it's something you can't prepare for uh, there is a way to live well and there is a way to die well, right? There is a way to properly say your goodbyes, to reflect, to practice stillness, um, I think, right? I, did, I, I listened to a lot of interviews with death doulas while I was writing this book. And so really try to think about what it means for someone who can see death that is maybe practicing uh, or attempting to practice and attempting to teach the people around her to practice like, stillness and and release and that that's what's so fascinating about this story um it's something i know that all human beings have to face right death and and grief they're such a big part of our lives but there's a real fear um in in i would say even like in in the culture i live in in, in english culture there's a fear around death there's this you know you don't talk about it you don't talk about grief you kind of just you know, you pretend it's not happening. You pretend, and then something like a pandemic happens, and it's everywhere. And people don't have the tools and the instruments. And I think that's why Floor is such an important character because she's trying to, she's trying to give her family the tools 
Right. But, and I think that's that's what's so powerful with what you've done over here. Um, family lore dances elegantly and powerfully between themes like death, grief, and magic. At its core, it's a family saga filled with the complexities of love, the many motherhoods, daughterhoods, and womanhoods the characters occupy. Um, so can you tell us how this story came to you? Did it come in a dream? Or did, yeah. where did the seeds come from? You know, I I love the Neil Gaiman um, quote that he has that like all stories are just a confluence of different experiences a writer has, right? And for me, that feels very, very true that this novel is, um, has many beginnings. It, it is, uh, it was almost cobbled together as I sat and reflected and and little moments would come through or um, I was having lunch with a cousin of mine and she's like, oh, I have to tell you a story. Like it's, this is good enough for a novel, right? And, and we start gossiping about our family and I'm like, wait, actually that might be a really great kernel for a, a book, right? Like mm -hmm. not the whole book, but that's a that's an interesting thing, right? And I file it away. Um, my mom often has dreams where, where either people die or she'll dream of certain numbers and then she goes and plays the lotto, right? And so- <laughs> dreams hold a really big significance um, in my family and I would say for a lot of superstitious Dominicans um, and we tend to be a very superstitious lot so that that makes sense but um, so then Floyd's character and this seer came to be I watched the documentary that was talking about rituals of death and how um, we you know communities throughout the world are changing how they ritualize not only death but but pre-death we don't really have, you know, the ceremonies um, around uh, releasing someone, right? It's not until, or, or we have, we have once someone has passed, but, but you know, the the concept of giving someone their flowers while they're here, you know, all the things that go unsaid, all the things you wish you had cherished or held, that that is a little different, and so then I began thinking about what would it look like to ritualize goodbye while you can still say it. So the novel was almost this um, hodgepodge of moments and of kind of just in the back of my brain collecting um, different scenarios and fun facts and um, situations long before I began actually writing, right? I, my brain was was just percolating and, and seeing what worked and, and no, maybe that's a different book. Maybe that's a different story. There were a lot more characters and I had to know this is getting too, <laughs> too muddy, um, right? There's already enough characters. More would have been, I think, really difficult to juggle. Um, so the book kind of came in pieces. And this is, I'm so glad you brought up the amount of characters there are in this book because that is actually my next question. This book is told in six different voices, by multiple generations of women. The lyricism of each voice is very unique, as unique are each, as e each woman's gifts, right? Um, can I ask you what it was like to have six different voices living in your head whilst you were writing this? Like, how did you, it, it's, it's so hard, um, but you managed to accomplish it really beautifully. Thank you. Yeah, it was, um... I think trying to make each one distinct and their their particular arc in the book distinct mm. and keeping that straight was maybe hard at first. And then as I got to know them, it just became very clear when an idea would come up, like who that idea needed to belong to and who it made sense for and how the trajectory of the novel was going to kind of follow behind them. I'm I'm not someone who plots right? And so I'm not driven by this has to happen next in the story. I'm driven by um, who who the characters are and what comes up for them. And, and so I just wrote, I wrote a lot in each voice and then kind of had to piece together what would, what would stick, right? And what I would have to kind of just uh, put in my little 
deleted file and and mourn on another day right no Um, no, yeah we all have that all writers have their little secret trash bin that they pretend they're going to use one day and it's really just a a soft goodbye to the words that weren't right Um, but I but I think they were really distinct to me and and it helps that each one of them has a, a kind of magical talent and that although that talent is not where they profit from except for Yari right who who has this inherited a taste for limes and and is now someone who um works with food everyone else it's just it's just who they are it's just Mm. what what is innate to them but it's not what they do right their magic and so it made it really easy because it was a part of their innate characteristic to have a piece of magic to let that kind of guide how I um wrote them and so floored who can see death and has been able to see since she was really little in dreams, you know, she's a little disconnected from the corporal world, right? Outside of her daughter, who I think she she's very anxious about and kind of ties her to humanness. She's she's in the air a little bit. She's not fully feet on the ground. And so writing her as someone who just um, is proper and and just wants the absolute goodness of, of a a simple life and a simple death, right? Like it's gonna come, I know it is, and I'll just return to what I was before. She has that kind of ease. Um, Matilde is someone who had to cobble together her own magic, right? She's the only sister who doesn't have something innate. And so there is a little bit of watching her flail and needing to forge her her strength because it wasn't something that that was uniquely uh, inherited from from her lineage and so you you kind of watch her at 70 something realize like it's never too late to to find your what what your purpose is or one of your purposes and to go after it and to um process what what a situation that you might have gotten yourself into that doesn't serve you can look and feel like and whether or not you're going to let that go, even if it might be really scary. And so each one of them kind of uh, revealed themselves mm. over time and, and, um, and their voices came along with that. And I think that's so powerful because um, like you said, so much of this book is about death, but also rebirth. Right. Um, and and the, the, the many, uh, there's that line, isn't it? That, that, all the women you know and love are going to be going to a lot of funerals of their earlier selves and earlier versions of themselves. And you do that so beautifully in this. You help us meet those versions of themselves. And then you watch what they've had to let go and you grieve with them very viscerally. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. I think that's the hardest thing with multiple point of views. It's just how do you make them feel real for a reader um, and make each one feel real? And, and and I don't, it wasn't like an even number, right? It's not like every single character is gonna have seven chapters, right? Like I don't <laughs> like that. It was what, who do we need to hear from um, in this particular moment? And, and some characters, their arc is just, more readily explained in an 11 and some characters for for the purposes of structure and craft only get one right and it's like that you have to um write into the gaps and a lot of this book is about silence and and writing into the gaps and the things that these characters withhold and the things that they that they say and how you make story right and and I don't know if you have this in in your family or um, folks you know but the book is a collection of oral storytelling and so it is how do you collect stories when people are reluctant or they have faced trauma that makes it difficult to talk or it's a story you've heard time and time again and so how do you insert your own opinions or your own contextualization or your own disruption in order to make it an interesting story and so you you literally see the project of collecting oral history uh on the page, right? That is what the narrator is attempting to do is this collection process. And that that was probably one of my most favorite things as well about the book. There's so many things I love, but there's a line I wrote for a novel I never finished years ago. And it is literally every family has an archivist, whether that archivist is 
appreciated depends upon the family. And it's because trying to get these stories out of my grandmother is so hard um, in my family. I'm the archivist. And that's why I have so much of a love for Ona, because I think mm -hmm. she's trying to do something which is very hard, you know, trying to get her family to talk. And yeah. the, the, the piece that you read um, for, from the in, like where she's been asking these questions that kind of really shows how you know it takes time to draw that out but she manages she manages and then of course your beautiful poetic lyrical work does it gives these characters the flesh and the meat and it's very powerful to see so I want you to talk a little bit more about the archiving the archiving within a family if that's okay yeah, um, that was a, a kind of discovery. I didn't go into this novel thinking that the collection of stories was going to be um, a part of it, right? It, it, it To me, the, the living wake was the kind of scaffolding. So we have a living wake in three days, and each day we are kind of experiencing the characters different. On the first day, we see each character on their own. On the second day, we see different groupings and on the day of the wake, we finally get them all together. And so for me, that was the catalyst of how the present day structure was going to work. And then we have the past that keeps interrupting them as they are attempting to move through their days, right? And, and then the book kind of became, a, maybe not a book within a book, but a project within a project, right? Mm -hmm. Where um, I had to think through who, how, who is gathering these, right? Like some of this is so intimate and maybe it's me, the writer, but wouldn't it be really, one of the questions that came up was Ona is a professor. She's an anthropologist. She is keenly aware of what it means to chronicle humanness. Um, what would it look like if if there's a yearning within her and it's a, it is a yearning all of a sudden to maybe grow her family, but there's a yearning within her work that that it started to feel empty and what would fulfill that right and for for Ona she kind of keeps coming back to um not just procreation and not just the next generation but like what 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 is lineage what is lineage and what do we lose when we're not kind of really thoughtfully um listening to each other and so then the questions kind of became a little bit more interesting on why, oh, how her insertions into certain um, stories was coming through and why all of a sudden there was an I and what it meant to constantly be reminded that everything we are reading is being filtered through a voice and a, a person with a point of view and a, a character who is letting us see some things and and, and is asking certain questions and then is looking away from certain things. And so then that became an interesting device to play with for me to kind of this push and pull of, yeah, she might not ask all the questions certain readers want her to ask, right? <laughs> she might not um, hone in in certain places. She might not push certain people to say things. And, and then she, and she might, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to even have to guess the questions that she's asking, because mm -hmm. what she asks is never written on the page. You're only getting the response. And so to, to have to do the work of kind of um, piecing together, right, in the same way that she is piecing together, um, it felt fun for me to kind of give readers uh, work. And I think this book is maybe more than any of my other books, um, asking readers to really be prepared to do some of the labor. And I, I really appreciated that because um, the, the, the in the there's a whole question I have about the interviews uh, anyway, but what, what I want to kind of really talk about is one of one of the most devastating parts of the book for me. I've been I've been dying to ask you this question. Oh. So I've been holding I've been holding on to this one. Pastora's childhood was one of the most devastating parts of this book for me because Pastora as a character is very tough, very yes. fierce. She's got like that spine made of like granite, you know, kind of yeah. such an uh, incredible character, quite stubborn in her own ways, you know, which I really appreciated because she kind of reminds me of my mom. 
Um, yeah. And the thing is, what I enjoyed about her is the fierceness, but also her gift of being the truth, you know, of seeing the truth in people and mm -hmm. holding that with such courage. Um, and within that scene, there's this very painful moment that happens for her because she is who she is, because she stands up for herself. Um, and it ends up leading to something which then leads to a lot of pain for her. Um, can we talk a little bit about the mirror that you're holding up for us here about patriarchy and generational trauma and childhood wounds? Because all of that happens in that section of this book. And I think it's, yeah, it, it really, it moved me and it shook me. And I really wanted to talk to you about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think your read of Pastora is really spot on, right? That as she was always kind of, fierce and wild right and and just wanted to be wanted to be bigger and hungry right metaphorically and also physically she was hungry and and so you have a character like that that's just like a a go-getter in the world wants like trying to satiate this this thing inside of her and you kind of see people tend attempt to snuff that out it, it can be really really hard um and particularly because of reputation or because of what will people think or this outside thing. And I think she was a character that because of her, her kind of fierce nation, nature isn't greatly appreciated. And, and there are common, you know, there is commentary on what the generations of women prior to receiving proper care, you know, do with postpartum depression. How did they maybe process that there were feelings they felt towards their children or, or a particular child that there might be resentment there might be right there might be really hard feelings that that they had nowhere to put right mm -hmm. and and so it is about pastora it is about her mother it is about um how we inflict pain on on the weak and what it means to just look away right maybe you're not the one doing the harm but but because of um well it's not my place you know, we might look away from from harm being done, especially within a family, the way that we oh. might let uh, in extended families, we, we, well, that's, you know, that's, that's what their parents choose to do, or maybe I'll drop a word here, or there, but it's not my place to interfere and, in, you know, where those lines are drawn. And so I think that seeing Pastora in her most vulnerable, especially someone who you have to imagine is incredibly bitter and jaded because she she knows when you're lying and people lie all of the time. <laughs> so mm. she is, um, she was not soft when it comes to the truth of who humans are, but, but, you know, she engages with someone who literally wants to crush her. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's, uh, it says a lot about who comes to, to her rescue right? And then who she proceeds to rescue. We see we see each of the sisters attempting to rescue each other yes. over and over again, right? Circular almost. Um, and this isn't a book about direct confrontation. There's very rarely like a, mm -hmm. hey, you need to, right? It's a book about like, how can I finagle whatever I need to do to help mm -hmm. extract this person from this, right? So it is a lot about um, the sideways nature that that people engage in when they don't have the power to just directly fix something. Yes. And so have to um, attempt to, to offer assistance in a very kind of sly um, sideways <laughs> way. Yeah. And so we are watching them each do that. And, and she might be one of the first early examples of how you know, sis, the sisters had to kind of step in and um, and and it, and how it changed the trajectory of their lives, right? She could not return to her mother's house after um, undergoing the kinds of confrontations that she underwent. Like there, there was no way she could forgive her mother for putting her in that situation. And so, and because of that, right? One of the other sisters cannot return to her mother's house because she refuses to leave her. And so that is one of those those pivots. It is one of those those small debts. It is one of those moments of. I mean, she lost her mom in some way. She she becomes pretty estranged from her, um, and yet her mom enters in a different capacity. And so I think 
Pastora story I I I love because of the relationship. Pastora is your dearest mom. So the interview that I did with your dear yeah, is yeah. they did not learn it from our mothers, right? So she's talking about Pastora. And I think if you ask Pastora, she could say, no, I didn't learn it from my mother, right? So <laughs> Um, the inheritances of of trauma and of silence um, that a lot of us receive. And this I'm is so these answers are so long. I'm gonna try to like no. nip them in the bud. <laughs> no, I love listening to you talk about this because a lot of what you're saying are actually they they lead up they, they beautifully lead up into the questions which I've written. So it makes so much <laughs> sense. Um, but this this you know the motherhood and the unease of motherhood and the unease of daughterhood is such a core part of this book though isn't it it's honor's relationship with floor um you know yari's relationship with pastora and yari's relationship with her grandmother mama sylvia they are it's it's so interesting to see the complexities of love over there because they they love each other just like the sisters all really love each other. Pastora wants to save every single one of her sisters out of all of them. You know, she's the one who's ready to have those confrontations. But because she respects her sisters and loves them, she, you know, she tries. Yeah. She tries, tries to do it their way. And you can see how much it like, she's just like, I just want to go in there and just fix it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> And I think there's something really amazing about um, the way, the complexity of of generate of of relationships between women who are related to each other has been done in this book because there is that unease, there is you know grief, there is pain, there are things that they blame sort of blame each other for, but mm. you know they can't necessarily because the past is is it constantly interrupts them as you said and I think that's such an important part in the craft of writing this book so you know I think my question over there is more when it comes to the complexities of writing a family saga like this with a past which constantly interrupts um how much of this book like how big was the initial version of this book because I can imagine it was a lot bigger <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this book has had a lot of iterations in that there were sections that didn't end up making the book. Each sister had, there was just more to each of their sections, um, but it was actually a really slim first um, first draft. And I, in general, like, um, I don't like too much padding. And so I think in trying to, when I put it all together though, and read through it, I realized there was just, we just needed more context to connect each of the of the stories. And so that added um, a little bit, but it was, it was, uh, I think 70,000 words was the first draft. And I think it closed somewhere around 90, um, which is, is very solid, right? It, it's a hefty um, book, but, but when we think about traditional family sagas, especially of the Latin American tradition, um, you know, I, I still think it's a, it's a compressed kind yes. of saga, especially with the, with the structure of, you know, the three days of the wake, you, you, you have the pressure of time that when we're reading over the course of, you know, 75 years, a hundred years of someone's life, we, we often don't think of time as compressed, but, but the book does this thing of, it's almost like an accordion, right? Like it, it is, you no, know, you have, this is a really short amount of time and then you, you're in the past and it, it opens up and then it, you're back in the days. And um, I, I think it felt important to do those interruptions that people who are nostalgic by nature, families that are always thinking of the back in the day or this is who we were, um, this is who we could have been will will maybe really appreciate the kinds of ways that until you look at the past it's really hard to not let it interrupt your daily it, mm -hmm. it, it'll come through in the most you know nonsensical of, of times most unusual of ways yeah so family lore is this deeply lyrical book in which you've taken two languages 
um, and, and multiple time periods and you've put them all together and to tell the story. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the literary decisions that you made to tell this tale. For instance, you know, the interviews with family members throughout, it's like brain candy, right? Like for the reader who's like kind of going, okay, there's going to be a chapter and then there's going to be a chapter. And then suddenly there's this interview and it's like, oh, oh my God, this is amazing. Like, so, <laughs> so if you could talk a little bit more about your literary decisions, that'd be amazing. Yeah, uh, I wanted to play with structure. And I think one of the reasons that this book is for adults is because um, you had like the reader had to kind of surrender to the fact that the, the structure was doing something different. There were a lot of elements that were kind of being um, stirred together. I, and you'll see this in some of my other books. I like different kinds of windows into a story. I like a narrative that has a perspective that unexpectedly comes through. If you've read the Poet X, you know, Xiomara Batista would have these um, first drafts of, of um, homework assignments, of essays that she had to write for class. And so you would see her first draft, which was always really intimate and vulnerable. And then you would see what she would turn in, which was a little bit more, there was distance in what she, and what she ultimately turned in, right? Until, until she could be brave enough to, to turn in the truest version, right? And so to me, that was a window in Imani Santiago um, with the Fire on High, which is um, a novel about a teen chef. You, you see her recipes, but her recipes are written in ways where um, it's not just like the boom, boom, bap of like this, that, like add this, add that. It's like, she's she adds feelings she adds music she adds um setting right as a part of her recipe and to me that was a way to showcase a uh, mindset and an, an, an emotional interiority right that you wouldn't get right throughout the story and so for this book the way that I kind of wanted to create those outside windows was through Ona's voice and through the fact that she is a uh, anthropologists and originally they were abstracts they were these like sections that you assumed were coming from her research um and then those abstracts became these these kind of interruption parentheticals where she will give a little information if you're familiar with a novel that has footnotes right which I think yeah. there have been a few more right where you you all of a sudden get a piece of information that is real world information Ona is kind of doing that but just without the footnote so you can imagine that it's like she's writing, she's transcribing a story and then she kind of inserts a little thought and then keeps transcribing. And, and that felt like just these, these little windows into historical context, into this outside view that can help us interpret some of what we're receiving um, from, from the culture and from the family that, that is just sitting with some of it. To give an example, um, there's a section where you're learning about someone being sent off to a knot to do work, and it's basically servitude, right? And I think for a lot of people, you would wonder, like, hold on, how, like, why would you send your child <laughs> to go serve in some in another family member's house, right? Yeah. And Ona interrupts and is kind of like, oh, loaning of family members is actually pretty common, and like this is how it worked in the Dominican Republic, right? And then she fades out again and you keep getting the story. And so to me, it was a way to, um, just this other window into the larger world. And then we're back into the world of the sisters and the and the daughters. But So we would do this kind of in and out um, thing. And the interviews were, were just to solidify that, to just, mm -hmm. you know, confirm time and again that um, this entire project is a storytelling project. This entire yes. project trying to receive what someone is saying and what they think is most important and and how they are and are not answering certain questions mm -hmm. um, and what is considered valid and credible research even if we don't know what will ultimately come of it and the collection of of a family stories has purpose even if it's it's not going to be you know we don't know what it's going to be yeah. and so I, so to me, that's what the, the interviews and the parentheticals and even with memory, you, you're kind of, you see whenever they go into a deep memory, they literally, the page drops, right? There, it's a paragraph that's set aside and it drops in. 
And so even wanting to play with how things appeared on the page was, was an attempt to uh, constantly move the reader um, with me into these, these different windows. Like now look here and I'm going to physically make your eye look in a way that it may not have been prepared to. And that that's, it's, I found that really successful because it really, it makes you, um, it, it forces your brain into a different space in the sense that you you kind of are like, you know, where you're so used to the narrative structure of like a book where you're like, okay, chapter, chapter, chapter. This is like, no, now there's an interview. Now you get to know a little bit more about this character that in a way you weren't expecting, haha. So I really love that. Um, so it's hard to pick a favorite character in this book because all of them have been so beautifully written and I feel so much for Pastora. Um, but I have a really soft spot for Yari, uh, who is heiress to a taste for limes, which again, is such a stunning gift, right? Um, I think it's her heartbreak with Ant that we experienced so viscerally. I cried for her and I cried for him too. She also demonstrates how living with the gift can be really uneasy sometimes, we can actually actually see a girdling of her body, but also her story touches on mental health so powerfully, right? And can we talk more about that? The the way that you've used the gift to communicate her issues with her mental health. So I yeah. think that's really powerfully done. Almost every woman in the book is anxious, right? They they mm -hmm. each pass that down, um, and and we realize that even their grandmother who you know, it's not described as having mental health, like had had mental health, like had depression, right? And anxiety is a form of depression. And so we're seeing the ways that they they inherit and what they inherit. I think for Yadi, it is the clearest. Mm -hmm. um, and it is something that because of her, her love story with Aunt who was incarcerated when they were teens, um, kind of broke open all of the the worries she was such a a straight lay straight shooter very like her mother in some ways uh precocious um and it undid something in her to kind of lose her her best friend and her childhood love and we we watch her try to come back right and make a life that um feels really fulfilling even if it might be outside of the lines i I, I wanted to kind of look at anxiety through a lot of different lenses and how each of them deals with it. And, and Yari's is the most right straightforward in that she she goes to therapy, she takes medication, she does deep breathing, she <laughs> stands her body and like you know reminds herself she's intact. Um, and the taste for limes is a is a curious inheritance, right? Limes are are quite bitter. Um, you can make them into something really great and and also they're very acidic and they're hard on your stomach and they're hard on your stomach lining which is like the center of like where our nervous system is and so <laughs> it's all very very circular in like how Yadi often engages in the things that make her anxious um, mm -hmm. and has and forces herself to confront time and time again exactly what what is the the root, right? Until until you know she kind of has it all comes to a head. Mm -hmm. um, and part of it is, I think she's a character that is suspended a little bit because of of what didn't come true for her. Um, and so we un until there's closure there, she's she's kind of just in this spinning. Um, and, and we're watching the three days where, where she is about to really have to make a choice around how do I confront, you know, the, my yeah. teams are, and how do I process? And so, um, yeah, I think, I think hers is really interesting because she also didn't inherit her taste for limes until much later where they mm -hmm. each had their own talent. Hers came much later than anyone else in the family outside of Matilde who, who doesn't have magic. Um, and so there is a little bit of like her anxiety is directly attached to, to her lines, to her gift. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's 
one of the things that you, you talk about in the book is like how each member of the family, the gift comes to them when it comes to them. Like they don't go out really seeking it. Um, it just, the sisters just get their gifts when they do, um, just like Yari gets her gift way later. And I really enjoyed um, the aside there from Ona who talks about why lines and like the history of lines in, in, I thought that was so powerful. And I thought it was such a great thing to know um, history like that, which brings me to my next question, which is the locations in this book play a huge part in the story. So the, the Dominican Republic, as well as, you know, New York, and to the extent that you can like taste and smell everything that you're describing, like, so I can see this book like as a movie in my head because it's so powerfully described. Um, but what you do so well is you talk about the immigrant experience from the first generation and then the second generation as a first generation immigrant myself in this country. I have a really big appreciation for how you've used that experience to not only talk about generational divides, but also like how these two places have had such an important part with the telling of this story. Yeah, I mean, it is a story of, of diaspora, right? Uh, I think of family lore almost slightly more of a diaspora story than an immigrant story because we were getting the 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 slow each each person comes to the U.S. each of the older generation in their own time and in their own for, for their own reasons um, and then their children are raised here and we watch them either go back and forth or or completely abandon the Dominican Republic and it is this kind of um, I think leaving homeland is always a wound and is always a, um, a, a thing that you try to soothe. And mm -hmm. I think when you're raised in a place that you feel doesn't love you um, or see you, there, th that wound is reopened in a different way in, in the next generation. And so we kind of watch how, how homeland is, is treated. And I've always been really curious as a Dominican American, like as what I, I call, like I'm an island girl, right? And I'm an island girl, I think by inheritance in that my people come from islands. And so we are just our relationship to, to water, to the tropics, to um, most islands, at least in this side of the world have been colonized to colonization is, is particular. Um, but then Manhattan, right? the the New York of New York City right like the center <laughs> I, I would say <laughs> um, I'm not biased <laughs> Manhattan is also an island and so I was yeah. raised with water on all sides I was raised kind of with this perspective of I'm connected to the other boroughs but also we are we are self-contained mm -hmm. um, yet they were so drastically different to me New York and and the Dominican Republic although both islands just ha could not even I could not even occupy them in my brain at times that like they just felt like different you know fantasy worlds when I was in the Dominican Republic the the memories I would make of New York City um were colored in a particular way and when I was in New York what I learned of the Dominican Republic felt like fairy fairyland and so it it is curious I think what what it means to be from islands and and the different interpretations we can have of of an island girl um when literally one is new york city right <laughs> so so i think we there's there's a play there between place and um and how you're constantly trying to rehome yourself uh, yeah. constantly trying to rehome yourself is such a perfect way of putting it because um what you said, you know, like, what does it mean to come from a place that doesn't love you or doesn't, or you don't feel like you fit in then, but it's supposed to be home. That's kind of how I feel about home. So I found myself um, empathizing a lot with the older generation. So with Flora and Pastora, sometimes over Ona and um, Yari, you know, because I kind of was like, well, I, I understand where they're coming from when they talk like that, when they say those things to you. And then I'm sitting over there going, oh my God, like I'm, I'm turning into my mother. Um, <laughs> um, but I thought like it, it, you know, to come from a place 
and have that in your bones and then come to another place and build something off your bones that comes across so well in the book as well um it really is so powerful so craft wise since we're talking about this this book craft wise family lore is a marvel you've played with the past alongside the present powerfully but what struck me was how each narrative was like a masterclass on beautifully constructed sentences that weave together into this brilliant story and you've already talked a little bit about the process uh, of writing this book but what was the process did you did you do a lot of traveling when writing this book did you talk to a lot of family members when writing this book right um this book was written, uh, the bulk of it, while we were in um, social isolation, right? So I began, I, I wrote maybe one of the chapters in 2019 and didn't really write much else, but I already knew like, okay, this is going to be the next book. And then in 2020, May of 2020, I really hunkered down and began kind of my writing practice. So 2020, 2021 is when I'm writing these stories and so you know I'm talking to my mom almost every day um checking in on her making sure she has groceries making sure she's wearing her mask that you know just all of those things but we live in different cities and so just just those checking she's checking in on me um there was so much fear in that in that point in time uh I'm taking a lot of long walks you know trying to get out of the house as much as I can and just like get fresh air. Um, and I think it's important to know that context that that writers who were writing during the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic, um, we were in our heads for, for a lot of it, right? We, particularly, I mean, it was just my husband um, and me in our house and, um, I didn't have, I don't have coworkers. I don't, you know, so I, it was just me spending time with these characters. So interviewing my mom was big. Um, near the end of 2021, I traveled to the Dominican Republic and visited where she was uh, raised. Mm -hmm. And we went with two of my other aunts. And so um, I wouldn't say I necessarily interviewed them at that point I had I think what I what the story was going to be a good amount of it and I didn't want it to feel too autobiographical in that like I'm interviewing too many people so I let you know I let my mom be the one who answered a lot of the questions of you know why did you hand wash did you know anyone with a washing machine she's like no washing machines didn't exist and I'm like <laughs> there are definitely washing machines in the 19th century, but okay <laughs> But that is your that is your that was your perception right or talking to her about the first time she saw tv and and needing to kind of sit with like what does it mean if you grow up and the only faces you ever see are just your family or the people from your town and so your perception of of yourself of beauty of of um the world is is you know really different than those of us who grow up seeing images of of you know, millions of other people, right? I, I'm guessing by the time you're you're my age, probably, I, I don't know, maybe we've seen millions of faces on TV, been watching TV since I was, right, a baby. And so you are just exposed in a different way to, to what you think beauty is, to self-worth, to, um, to strangeness, to foreignness, to, to, to self, to likeness, right? And so, I, it was mostly her. It was mostly her that I would turn to when questions came up. But that trip to the Dominican Republic was one where I just listened. I didn't ask any questions. I didn't ask them to tell me about coming to the U.S. or about their loves. Or I just, you know, sat in the car as we drove to their childhood home. And then as when we got there and they talked to neighbors, they knew when they were children and they're now all 70. And like me to like reconnect with like their childhood playmates that they knew you know, 60 years ago, right? And just like the love and the affection. And and so for me, that trip was one that informed the emotional chord of this book mm -hmm. uh, and just let me kind of observe and just um, kind of just cake myself in the, in the, in the clay of like, okay, this is, this is the world. This is the setting. This is 
what it means to return to your childhood and, mm. and joyous and be and still have a child in yourself you turn to mm. um and so I think the process was one of, of listening and then it was just making it was just kind of um sewing together the different pieces of what I had imagined and um the different perspectives that were coming in there were a lot of post-its where I would have each character's name at the top and they were all color-coded and you know, I'd be in the middle of dinner and I'm like, oh, this has to happen. I just run upstairs and like write a quick post-it note, right? And my husband's like, <laughs> this book you're writing is really something, right? And then I would take those down when I wrote those scenes and I would put up the post-its um, depending on what came to mind. So it was a book that was very, um, I kind of just trusted my ear and my, mm. my, my imagination to, to weave. And I don't know if I'll ever write a book like this again I don't I think it taught me a lot about different kind of processes but I'm also okay with like this was a novel that relied on intuition and it's mm. what this book needed at that point in time mm. and it may not be what future books will will rely on or lean on um and it is okay that this piece of art that was what the process dictated um, because of the point in time we were in, because of where my creative space was, and because of like the the subject matter that it the process reflected what the book required. That's you know that 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 is the thing that I think comes through so well is the intuitive aspect of the book. Like you really let the characters lead the story. Um, and yes, I know that Ona does come in and like give us like a little bit of like context and like some historical cues, but it very much is led by these characters that you've created. Um, and I, I do understand putting up these little scenes on the wall because, and then getting an idea in the middle of the night sometimes and coming and running and writing it. Um, yes, bless our partners and husbands for... <laughs> <laughs> we're just dealing that as uh, with that aspect wait. of it that's the way we'll eat later <laughs> <laughs> that's the one um i i did want to talk a little bit about the the more some of the more difficult themes in the book and then i'm going to end with like you know um i could talk to you forever but i think i'm gonna have to re reduce my questions to just two more um but one of the, the 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 more difficult themes of the book, uh, especially to read, but also was such a necessary right, is infertility in a book which is about rebirth and death. So infertility and miscarriage, um, they are they're they're heavily in the book, and yes. I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about like the characters, what they go through, the way that different generations deal with it because you have talked a little bit about how you know back in the day there was like no name for postpartum and how does that you know how it affects each character um all the way down to the characters now who are facing this problem so yeah I mean I I think right we the book is about women's stories and the women's stories that are that we consider worth telling and that we don't consider worth telling until we ask the right question and then someone's like oh yeah let me tell you about that right um and so and, and I think when we consider medical history that often is relegated to unless you ask the exact precise question you're I won't speak for you but um in my family and in families I've observed you don't get information about your medical history particularly if you're a woman right there's so much that's been considered shameful or that's just like oh well everyone has fibroids I thought you knew I had them and it's like no you probably should have told me because those that's kind of um an inheritance it's a, it's an actual physical inheritance or you should have told me um about difficulties with conception because that that is often inherited right uh, when we talk about depression or trauma your mental health can affect conception that is an inheritance and so it, the the book does kind of consider the ways that there are cycles and there are cycles that go unbroken for a really long time predominantly because people don't talk right and so it's difficult to find medical help or or outside assistance because everyone is kind of 
living in the silence of their own, this is just happening to me. And so there's no way that, you know, I can fix this, or this is just meant, or this is just fate. Um, and, and, and so it, 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 it does, it is kind of thinking through when there's this, um, it's just acceptance of, of loss. Um, and, and also what does it mean to want to have children and not be able to, to have this deep desire either for yourself to expand your family because you, you think you, you owe it to someone to, yes. to, um, increase the family. Um, and you know, there's one of the characters that, that really questions, like, I am more than than my womb, and she and she, that's a character that wanted children, but then it's like, well, just because I didn't have them doesn't mean I'm not relegated. I'm not relegated to like what I didn't have. Like there's still so much I do have, and so it is. It is. Uh, there's a push and pull, and a lot of challenging of um, of loss of of infertility of yeah. uh, how people talk about infertility or. Um, accept it or don't accept it, having those conversations with your partners, trying to describe the desire for children when you're a fourth generation, right? You're fourth wave feminist and you're like, I am fulfilled in and of myself. And also maybe I think I want to do this thing and I don't, I didn't think I did, right? Mm -hmm. And now how do I, how do I sit with that? So um yeah, it's a, it's a big part. It's a big part of the book. And in general, right, like I'm thinking a lot of, of Black maternal health, of um, non-white women's maternal health and the resources that they have. And so you kind of see the ways that the different generations have to process the yeah. the, the way that, that they had, what tools they had to try to address what was happening. Yeah. And that, I think that stands out so much in the story. Um, women's reproductive health and the way that women ourselves are taught to neglect neglect it or not tell the next generation about like things like you know oh yeah I struggled with my fertility so maybe you might have problems um I think there's something really powerful uh, about how those conversations end up kind of happening as well um and and so I'm going to come to the last question, which I really wish wasn't the last question, because I've got so much more to ask you about this book. So maybe, um, maybe hopefully I can do another interview with you and then ask you all the other questions I have. <laughs> um, spoilers. <laughs> yeah, spoil it's really hard to talk about a book I've realized that you, you, you know, obviously you've written and I, I've absolutely adored and read and lived in for the last week. Um, and, and then not give everything away like when you're talking about it. Um, but what I did want to ask you as my final question um, is what is the biggest thing you hope readers take away from this book? I hope readers walk away with a, um, maybe an expanded sense of, of curiosity about their own stories and who in their families have, have received the questions of, of, of love, like the big questions. Um, I think a key, right, to, to this book is, Ona is asking a lot about love and everyone is answering in, in a variety of ways, but the questions are all centered in love. How did you learn self-love? How do you learn to love others? How did you learn to love your children? How did you learn to love your mom? How did you, right? Like the questions that are not written, you know, you can, you can read into them as questions of love. And so I think learning about how our ancestors and our elders learned love, taught themselves love, what lessons they have on love, um, I think would be really fruitful to, to your own understanding of, of love. Love as a practice, not as a feeling you have towards someone. Love as, as community care, love as familial care, love as self-care, that, that it is a, a constant practice. And I, I'm, I am curious and I'm, I hope others are curious of like how do we practice that? And where can we learn from our people? And where can we forgive them for never having learned? Um, 
but also curiosity of just a book that maybe is following a different kind of structure, a book that I would say is innately Caribbean in its move in its back and forth, in its um, in its nostalgia. It feels like when you dance bachata, which is a very Dominican dance, and you take three steps forward and you take three steps back, and you can cross an entire right um, room dancing that way. But but it, but you have to go back to go forward. And this is a book that is in that movement. And so if you come and you want a very linear, very um, <laughs> Uh, tr well, not even traditional, right? Because I think I'm writing in a tradition, but but of a particular form in the English language, what we've learned, a book must move forward. It must be propelled that way. You know, I hope there's curiosity about other kinds of forms of storytelling um, and of collecting stories uh, because that, that was a part of the purpose. And so for me, it is about what are the questions that people are asking of themselves and of each other? And what are the questions that we can ask of writers? Yes, I love that. What are the questions we could ask of writers? Um, Elizabeth Acevedo, it has been a delight, a joy, a pleasure, all of the you. most wonderful things um, to talk to you about this masterpiece of a book. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for talking to me. And you can find family lore everywhere. Um, and you can pick it up from any major or independent bookshop across anywhere. And I highly recommend you do because you will love this book as much as I did. Thank you. Thanks, Nikita. Thank you for the productions and thank you readers.